Well, today we begin uh, chapter 11 of uh, Paul's epistle to, to the Romans. And as we do that, I want to remind you of something. What's of supreme importance is not what I say from up here, or what you think may be true, or what's comfortable, or what might make you and me feel good. No, the thing that's of utmost supreme importance is what does the Bible really say? And sometimes it says some things that's uncomfortable for us. You know, if the Bible really is the inspired, infallible Word of God, then you and I have got to take seriously everything in Scripture and wrestle with it, no matter how uncomfortable. If it's not the inspired, infallible Word of God, then we can dodge all that stuff. We don't have to take it seriously, and we are absolutely free to construct our own faith system. The driving reason we are in a new denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians, is pretty much, if not officially, in practice, the former denomination that this church was a part of practices the latter rather than the former, which has led to fuzzy thinking about matters of faith and practice, even some things contradictory to the clear teaching of Scripture. And so now that we're a part of, of ECO, all ECO does is uh, restore theolo- confidence in the Scriptures and theological clarity about what we Presbyterian-type Christians have always believed. And one of those areas of theological clarification is on a very difficult doctrine the doctrine of election slash predestination. You you cannot pull the two apart. And what ECO has done is restored, rightly so, that doctrine to its rightful place as one of our essential tenets of what we believe. And that's pretty much what Presbyterians have, have, have always believed. But this doctrine is mysterious, It's difficult for everyone to get their heads and hearts around, and it's absolutely unpalatable for some people, and some of you have told me that. But I'll tell you this, it is the antidote to spiritual pride for anyone and everyone who will embrace it as true. I have a friend, Ligon Duncan, he's the chancellor of Reformed Seminary, and Ligon told me one time about when he was a little boy, his grandmother, who's a Baptist, was afraid that Ligon, growing up in a Presbyterian household, would not become a Bible-believing Christian. And so she took it upon herself to disciple Ligon. She said, honey, we're going to meet every week, and I'm going to teach you how to be a Bible-believing Christian. And she chose for her curriculum the book of Ephesians. In the first lesson, in chapter 1, they get it verse 4, you know, before the foundation of the world God chose us. Well, she jumps over that, and then Paul peppers the text with the actual word predestination. But she doesn't make any mention of that. So at the end of the lesson, his grandmother says, well, Ligon, do you have any questions? And he said, Grandma, how come you didn't say anything about these words predestination? Now, Ligon had heard those before in his Presbyterian church. And she said, well, honey, we don't believe that. And they said, but but it's here in the Bible. Yeah, yes, but we don't believe that. (laughs) Now, we can chuckle and laugh, but if we're honest with ourselves... We're all a little bit of Ligon Duncan's grandma. We tend to read the Bible and we tend to want to dodge uh, and navigate around anything that's discomforting or downright unpalatable. To be a Bible-believing Christian simply means you read the scriptures, embrace what they clearly teach, no matter how difficult. You don't dodge anything. Let's attempt to do that this morning as we look at the first 10 verses of Romans chapter 11. So I would encourage you to open your Bibles and keep them open or look at the screen or the insert that you've been handed on the way in. And please please pray with me before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now hear God's word addressed to you and me, beginning to read at verse 1 of Romans chapter 11. Paul writes, I ask them, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have, they have demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christianity will go. It will vanish. It will shrink. I'm not here to argue it. I know I'm right, and I will be proven right. We're more popular than Jesus. That's John Lennon in a 1966 interview at the height of the Beatles' popularity. My friends, the text that lies before you and me this morning, when all the final dust of history has settled, John Lennon will be proven to be absolutely wrong. For two chapters now, Romans 9 and 10, you and I have listened in to Paul's agony agony over the fact that the vast, vast majority of God's chosen people, his fellow Jews, have rejected their very own Messiah. Rejection. You know, the nation of Israel, from its inception, has always been rejected. Rejected by all of the Palestinian countries around them during Old Testament times. Um, today, in our geopolitical scene, they are bordered by nations hell-bent on destroying the nation of Israel. Anti-Semitism has always been there from the beginning. It's here now, rife in our world today. Israel knows what it means to be rejected. And now here she is, rejecting God's Messiah. Logically, you might think that God's response to that would be that he's going to jump in on the rejection and reject Israel as well. In fact, Paul raises that question in verse 1. Has God rejected Israel? Well, he answers his own question in verse 1 by saying, no, by no means. And he says, I'm going to prove it to you. And he puts forward as exhibit A himself. He says, look at me. If you think God's rejected the Jews, I'm a Jew. Not only is Paul a Jew, he's a Jew of Jews. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. And then he throws in this clincher, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And what does that mean? The only son of Jacob that was actually born within the geographical confines of Israel was Benjamin. The holy city of Jerusalem sits in an area that was the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. When Solomon dies, civil war breaks out in the nation of Israel. Ten of the tribes go off and form the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah, out of which the Messiah arises, only one tribe sides with Judah, the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul's a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. But yet, if there's any Jew that's ever walked the planet, if there's any person that's ever walked the planet that deserves to be rejected by God, it's the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy was an antichrist. He hated Jesus. His mission in life became to obliterate the church of Jesus Christ. He hunted down Christians. He participated in their murders and executions. And yet, Paul, 
the most unlikely person winds up being a follower of Jesus, winds up being the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. What's going on here? Paul looks around, sees the vast majority of his fellow Jews rejecting Messiah, but he also sees a goodly number of them that have, along with him, come to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so in verses 2 through 5 of our text, Paul surfaces a very important biblical theme or concept, that of remnant. You can trace that all through the Old Testament. Whenever the nation of Israel rebels against God and God's, God brings judgment upon them, he never completely destroys them. He always preserves a remnant for himself. And Paul points to the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19 to undergird this. Now, if you know anything about Israel and Elijah's time, the nation was buried under an avalanche of apostasy. They were in utter rebellion against God. They were chasing after the pagan idol Baal. But it wasn't just heresy and apostasy. They were getting violent about it. They were tearing down the altars of God. And they were hunting down and executing, murdering God's prophets. And Elijah was on their hit list. And he knows it. And so he hightails it out of Israel. He goes into the wilderness and where we pick him up this morning. He is totally emotionally, spiritually, physically worn out. And he cries out to God. He says, look at God. What the nation of Israel has done as the chosen people. Look what they've done to your nation. Look what they've done to you, the faith. Oh, Lord, I alone am left. Do you ever feel like that? You're in your office and you go, Dad, Blaine, I don't think anybody else in this office is a Christian. Or you got dressed this morning, you're driving down here, you drove off your street, and everybody else is snug in their wee little beds. Are we the only family on the street that goes to church? Or maybe in your extended family, they look at you as, you know, mm, that's the guy that believes in the imaginary little man upstairs. You know? um, and you think, I alone am left. We might call that the Elijah syndrome. Get over it. It's never true. God always has more people than you think that are out there, even around you. What does God say to Elijah? Buck up, buddy. Quit throwing your little pity party and realize reality. There are 7,000 others who have never bowed the knee to Baal. He says in verse 2 that they're that way because God foreknew them. That's code, biblical code for election slash predestination, choosing them before the foundation of the world. And in verse 5, he says, they are chosen by grace. Now, once again, you and I right here bump up against the gracious sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation. And I guarantee you, as a fellow individualistic North American, 21st century American, Sometimes the whole gospel of grace just grates on me. We, we want egalitarian fairness. I risk, preaching straight through Romans, I risk you thinking that I'm some kind of broken record. Because if I stay with the text in Romans, Paul circles back again and again to drive home the gospel of grace. That when it comes to salvation, it's all of God, not of us. 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 The word grace appears 128 times in the New Testament. Why so many times? It's almost like God himself is a Johnny One Note. It's because the Jews, the vast majority of Jews in Paul's day, really thought, that salvation was all about what they could earn, achieve, or merit through keeping the law, doing good works. And I hate to say this, but I'm encountering too many Christians today, even some in this congregation, who when I say, are you sure of your salvation? They'll say, well, I hope so. I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Arrgh! Makes me feel like I need to preach 128 sermons on grace. Look at verse 6 of your text. Paul hammers home the facts, fact that grace 
excludes works, and works excludes grace. You cannot have it both ways. Think about it. What if it were possible, even the tiniest little sliver possible, for you and me to do something to earn merit or achieve our salvation through something we accomplish? Do you know what that does to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? At best, it makes it perhaps helpful. What it really does, it undercuts it completely and and negates it as a necessity. My friends, there is no salvation outside of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Now, Paul closes our text in verses 7 through 10 by making us even more uncomfortable about this whole election thing by saying it's the elect that get it. The, the elect get grace, the others don't. And we ask the question, well, why doesn't everybody get it? Let me give you the biblical answer. I don't know. <laughs> it just says that's true. And it makes us even more uncomfortable by saying, the others he hardened and gave them blind eyes. Oh, no. And stopped up their ears. Oh, and their backs are bent over from ever, forever, I think, because they're trying to carry the weight of their own salvation. And you and I can't bear up under that weight. Now, before you totally freak out and say, I'm going to go to the Unitarian Church down the street, <laughs> um, always interpret Scripture by Scripture. Paul writes Romans 1 to be the lens through which we're to see the rest of the letter. And when he talks about a hardened heart and quotes Isaiah and Deuteronomy and uh, and David about that, God never, ever has hardened a heart that wasn't already hardened. When humanity fell at the fall, being a sinner means you have a hardened heart, means you are already... You already have a spirit of stupor. You're insensitive to spiritual things. Your eyes are blind to the gospel, or to reality, Jesus. Your ears are deaf to the gospel. Anybody that doesn't have a hardened heart, it's a miracle. Paul had the hardest of heart that anybody's ever had. And yet, he's a believer. Why? Because God changed his heart. Why doesn't God change everybody's heart? Biblical answer. I don't know. I wish he would. I don't want anybody to go to hell. But he always preserves a a remnant. You know, I can put something in the sun, and some things will soften, and some things will harden. I can put butter in the sun, and it'll get softer, even melt. I can put glue in the sun, it always gets harder. And the longer it's exposed to the sun, the harder it gets. In Romans 1, remember the punishment for sin? There's just more sin. God just gives them over. He doesn't make them sin. Just give. If you're saved, it's totally a God. If you're not, it's totally your undoing. Can't blame God for that. Wait a minute, Ron. Why does he do this remnant thing? Why does he do everybody? Biblical answer. I don't know. I do know this, that in the presence of the sun, S-O-N, some hearts melt. Others are merely hardened. But the hearts that melt, like the Apostle Paul's, who were as bad as hard as you could get, that's the miracle of grace. That is the miracle of grace. That's the only reason I'm standing here today. I tried to outdo Paul, fell short, but I'm, I'm here. I do know this. Our response to this ought to be first humility. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I, I, there's nothing... I can stand here and go, see, God, I I deserve to be with you forever. No, nothing. Total humility. Undercut spiritual pride. Secondly, never stop praying for those around you who are hard-hearted. Oh, that person, they'll never come to Christ. Don't ever say that. I know former Hell's Angels, who now, one guy runs Bikers for Christ. Remember Paul, as hard a heart as you could get. Don't ever give up on anybody. Thirdly, assume everybody around you and treat everybody around you as if they were elect. And you don't know. The only person you can be sure of is yourself. There may only be two people in hell. Maybe everybody you place on the planet Earth is elect. I don't know. 
That's not my business. That's God's. Also, make a, one of your core values in life ought to be faith-driven risk. Get out on a limb. Invest your money, your time, your talents toward what God's doing among the least, the last, and the lost. And that's what this church is all about. And then, fourthly, exalt, exalt in the gospel of grace. That you are part of the remnant, that you have been sealed, and nothing can derail that train. And that's where yours and my joy is found. Doesn't matter what's swirling around us. When we know we are secure in Christ, that is the source of joy. Then finally, don't ever write off yourself. Maybe you're sitting here this morning going, I am a hard-hearted person. I really don't care much for Christ or the things of Christ. Don't give up on yourself. Remember Paul. Don't think I'm hopeless. I'm past God's ability to... I've gone down so low, I'm sure he can't reach that far. That's, That's Satan's lie. It doesn't matter. You look around you, it doesn't matter if the whole world seems to be anti-Christ. Don't fall for the Elijah syndrome. God always has his remnant. And when all the dust of history finally settles, John Lennon will be proven absolutely wrong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.